help Dan come to stage and give him a big hand and a big round of applause. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you look like a group that um, might actually learn something. It would be refreshing. I, I, I'd like to start out by saying, um, for those of you that heard me on the panel last night, how many were there for the panel last night, the last thing? The one thing I didn't say, by the way, I'm extremely pleased that you're here today, and today will be like no other day that you've ever had. You can liken it to the first sexual experience you ever had. <laughs> because I assure you, it's going to be an experience. Because I'm going to tell you what the Lord knows. And I'm not going to tell you a lot of baloney like you heard. Not a, you, Everybody that was there yesterday didn't give baloney out, but a lot of them did. The one thing I didn't put out to the audience yesterday, because I didn't think it was fair to Ted Thomas, is one of the individuals that spoke at that conference has been indicted in 10 states. They did a news special on Channel 5, and ch uh, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 10 o'clock news last night. They had filmed of the conference. Some of you were on that film tape that the guy that's being indicted for being a fraud, a lie, and a cheat. And yet people pay money to idiots like that. It's beyond my comprehension. It's one of the reasons, it's the main reason I got into this business. Because it irked me so, the crap that is sold to the investing public, the neophyte public. It, it grinds me, and if you can't tell, I'm uh, excited about this. It grinds me like nothing has, uh, has bothered me in the last 10 years. He sold the most product at that seminar. You bought it. I was going to ask for hands first, who bought his product, but I decided not to embarrass everybody. He's an idiot, at best, a lying, cheating fraud at worst. Last night I had the pleasure of having dinner with uh, Ted Nicholas, who's a good friend of mine, who has heard me speak a number of times and attended the Castle Seminar last May or June with his uh, significant other, I guess is what you call it, Bethany, who's a nice lady. And uh, they were telling me the amount of money, a product that he sold, and I could barely, well, that's not really true, I could barely get my fourth martini down. It was, it, I, I was that choked up about it. But um, it's, it's, it's beyond my comprehension. And the, um, this isn't about marketing. I don't know anything about marketing. As I told you, I sent out 65,000 pieces of a $3.40 or $3.80 item, and I didn't even put my phone number and address down. I mean... And if you multiply 65,000 times $4, I mean, it's a considerable chunk of change. So that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about quantum thinking, geometric thinking, not arithmetic thinking. You know, the old analogy is get outside the box and that kind of the dots and all that stuff. That's an essence, but we're going to take it a geometric step beyond that. Because when you take $820 and you turn it into $400 plus million, I mean, you, gotta, you can't ever think arithmetically. From the get-go, when I got started in business on July 13, 1982, uh, Friday the 13th, um, I had a lease fax machine, a phone, and I was in the nursery, soon the nursery of my newly born son, Dan Jr., who was born January 1st, 1982. I had two goals in life at that time. One, to build a $2 billion company, not $2 billion in revenue, but $2 billion in worth. And when I talk, as I said yesterday and the day before, when I talk about numbers, it's a $50 million company. It's not $50 million in revenue. It's because either the net worth or the equity or the market value or what we sold it for. So I wanted to build a $2 billion company. And second, and along with the $2 billion, I wanted to be one of the high, five highest paid energy executives in the world. I was successful on the ladder. I was the highest paid energy executive uh, three out of five years. And I was in the top five, uh, five out of five years. But I fell a billion five hundred and sixty million dollars short of my two billion dollar goal. 
and we're going to talk a lot about it today, but just think, what if I had set $10 billion goal, $20 billion goal? Or as I said yesterday, I believe, Ted Turner has taught me, and I'm still learning at age 49, Dan, set goals you cannot achieve in your lifetime. That's what quantum thinking's all about. Now, getting back to this doofus that made all the money at the seminar, and then I'm going to let it rest, but I like to beat things to death. I mean, I like to beat them so when they're down on their knees and then they roll over and I'm still kicking them. Most of the seminars that you've attended, and this isn't a touchy-feely seminar. I'm not here to make friends, as I told you yesterday. If you want a friend, buy a dog. Okay, yes. I mean, and, but I am here to tell you the truth. And uh, as I'll point out at least 50 times today, Every single vignette, every single story, every single example. It's not that I read 700 books like one of the, the local gurus has done. I probably haven't read three books. But I did it myself. And there's a big difference. And from, if you get nothing more from today than when you go on to read your next book, listen to your uh, next tape, or go to your next seminar, just measure what the person has accomplished that's flapping his lips on the stage. I'm here to say, and I submit to you, you probably won't go to another seminar again unless it's mine. Because if you use that benchmark, there's virtually nobody that's in the business success business that you ought to listen to. Now, if Ross Perot, Lee Iacocca, Scully Gates, and all the guys that you read about, or Rick Scott, who used to work for me, the president of Columbia Healthcare that just did a uh, merge this company with another company yesterday it was announced and they're doing 15 billion dollars in in revenue this year he used to be my lawyer he sat at my right hand doing deals with me and he went out on his own and now he's 10 times more successful than i am but unless one of those guys goes into this business i would submit to you you're wasting your money you're throwing it down with a tidy ball man i used to ask and i don't anymore because i'm a kinder gentler person I used to ask how much money people spend, have spent in their lifetime on feeling good, books, tapes, etc., etc. I don't do that anymore because it was shocking to me. I mean, I just thought, God, if I just had 10% of all that money. I mean, and there was a book written in the 70s called I'm Okay, You're Okay. Does anybody remember it? Okay. Well, the essence of that book, and I don't agree with I'm okay, you're okay, but the essence of the book is very 90-ish, you know. Whatever you want to do is okay with me, and whatever I want to do is, should be okay with you, and everybody's happy. Well, business isn't like that, ladies and gentlemen. And one of the things that I think will be, or should be, and hopefully will be, the most inspiring to you is that it's all right to think in a non-90s way and try to make money. I'm going to take advantage professionally, legally, morally of the other side. All deals aren't win-win. If you believe that, we can still refund your money and you can hit the door because they're not. If you think the KKR fellows who came out of Bear Stearns, same as I did, thought it was a win-win when they did the Nabisco deal a few years ago, if you thought for one moment that was a win-win situation, I got a bridge in Havasu I want to sell you. Because it's not. And as I said earlier, uh, or yesterday, not earlier, I think it's the same day, just a 40-hour day. As I said yesterday, and then we're going to get to the, the, the meat, or the beef as they say, um, I have never in my lifetime met a touchy-feely person that has been super successful, high performance in my life they're all killer assassins Don Taylor killer assassins buy that Bentley <laughs> now we've got some wealthy people in the audience he's one of them uh, very successful super successful and then but when I met Mr. Taylor he's been to the castle seminar he's been to uh, the mountain and um, he now has been rejuvenated, just like I was when I met Tur Turner for the first time a couple years ago. And uh, in instead of the book or that they were going to write about his life, uh, 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 think rich slowly <laughs> and grow slowly, think rich and grow slowly, I mean, um, he, he, he's got a different attitude. And I think that 
uh, no matter where you are in the continuum, from the neophyte to the successful entrepreneur business owner, you're going to come away with some raw data that you can use and make a lot of money. Because quite frankly, as I told you yesterday, I went to a harmonizer, some psychic person down here, because a very good friend of mine who's a doctor recommended her. And she said, after spending an hour with me, she says, you're not happy, you're not fulfilled, you don't like living in a castle, you don't like wearing $3,000 suits, you don't like giving your wife a million dollars in jewelry, you don't, I mean, she went on, you don't like riding limousines, and I mean, she went on and on and on, and I said, what are you, crazy? I mean, what do you mean I'm not happy? Well, if I'm not, this is the best, ex best uh, fraud in the country, because I'm, ha I'm so happy I ought to be investigated, you know, and, uh, and what I'm doing with my life, and one of the reasons, and it's not because I'm so beneficent, because, I mean, for the money that, and with the greatest respect, the money we're collecting here, I'd rather play golf. I mean, and that's the truth. But I have this passion to put the phony baloney personal development and success coaches out of business. I have a passion. Unless, that's why you should clap. Either that or they ought to come to my end of the continuum and you tell people, as they asked me last night, if you were broke and starting all over again, what would you do? I said, I'd be a personal development guru because all of them are dead broke and they collect money from people. You don't need any money. All of you ought to go into the personal development business. You don't need any money. You don't need any expertise. You don't need any degrees. You don't have to do... <laughs> you don't have to do a darn thing. See, I'm... Our editing costs are so high when I normally, because I use a lot of four-letter words normally, because business is a four-letter word, I'm telling you. But our editing costs, some of the tapes that I've done in the last year I've, are so garbled, I can't, we can't use them. I mean, so I'm trying to do this with no, no bad words. My, my children won't believe it because they, they know, you know, that uh, I talk that way. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a parent that talks that way around their kids because, I mean, that's what life is. I was firing a president of one of the companies I own at uh, Crown Room at Delta Airlines a few months ago. I flew in just to fire him, and I started screaming at him. And, um, and the, um, the, uh, the lady, the manager of the, the Crown Room, and that's the frequent flyer mile room or, or club or whatever, came up to me and said, you, could you keep it down? I said, uh, yeah. And then I kept screaming at him, and then they brought the security guards in <laughs> and to drag me out of the Crown Room. And so, uh, when the they were little guys, and I'm a pretty big guy, and I said, you better bring a lot bigger guys if you're going to drag me out of this room. <clears throat> and so, after about ten more minutes making my point, they walked me to the door, and I turned to the, the manager of the crown room, and I asked her, have you ever met the chairman of Delta Airlines? That's the, the airline. She goes, no. Well, his favorite word is MFR. <laughs> and I walked out, and I got in the elevator. That's life, and I'm not going to be up here, you know, some people on the panel, and everybody's got the right to make a living. God knows. As long as they're not taking your money and giving you crap, then I step in if I have anything to do with it, and they may never ask me to be on another panel, I don't know. But, I mean, uh, that's the first panel I've ever been on, and probably there's a good, good reason for it. <laughs> but, uh, now, they gave you a lot of good marketing ideas, but you can have all the best marketing in the world unless you understand things like structure fo or strategy follows structure strategy follows structure that's what you've been taught but that's not it structure has to follow strategy it's the first thing and most of you have built your companies to the extent that you have employees and just the opposite. We're going to go through things like that. Now, one of the things, if we have time, and if I don't get off on too many tangents, um, uh, is I'm going to try to walk you through the Great Western story from the day one to the day I left, which encompasses almost everything I'm going to talk about. And it's, 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 and it's going to happen sometime after lunch. And, uh, but it, it, it's really the key, because what I'm often asked is, well, Dan, how did you do that? And I'm, we're going to have time for questions later on in the day. And so be thinking up your biggest revelation, your biggest disappointment, your biggest challenge, which is a 90. Uh, there are no challenges, there are problems, you know. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is that if you are not experiencing anxiety, 
If your problems are not replaced, as soon as you solve one with a bigger one that's geometrically bigger, then you're not growing. I hate to hear people tell me my business is running smoothly, everything's great. Well, then he might as well, or she might as well blow their brains out because they sure as hell aren't growing. What my deal is all about is growing geometrically, quantumly. And just remember that and keep an open mind. Because I have been there and done that. There's no question about that. Yeah, yeah. Another thing, and I said this yesterday, just because you haven't done it, just because you've never been around somebody that hasn't, that hasn't done it, and just because you've never heard of it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Because absence of evidence is not evidence of their absence. I'm going to say some things that are real foreign to you. Some things that you've been taught by your parents, your grandparents in school. And basically, all that is crap. Now, I'm not talking about moral issues and things like that, or religion. I don't get into that. I was raised a Roman Catholic, if that tells you, and I'm still a Roman Catholic, and my wife's a convert Catholic, if that gives you any idea about where I stand on religion. But I'd be glad to debate any of that at, uh, during the break. So just keep an open mind. The, the high-performance people that I will continue to allude to all day long live in a different world than you. They came from the same world as you did, but they live in a different world. They think differently. Now, for those of you that know people that said they were going to come today and they couldn't, there's, there's a number of reasons. So I'd like, to, I'd like to address those who couldn't join us today. They've got reasons like, I don't need a coach. I don't need a seminar. I don't need to listen to tapes. I don't need to read a book. I can do it. And so the question that I would ask them, why haven't they? Now, cumulatively in this group, I'm sure you've read a lot of books, listened to a lot of tapes, and seen a lot of videos, and listened to a lot of programs on TV. I think, I think, I know that come five or six o'clock this afternoon, you will have discarded most of that information. What's the computer term when you um, take, yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Geigo? Is that, yeah. Geigo. Gigo. Well, you've had a lot of information and a lot of data, but most of it's been garbage. And garbage in, garbage out. I mean, so you have, you cannot be blamed for the decisions you've made vis-a-vis -vis your businesses or, the, or, 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 or your work. You can't because of the information. You put the information in and you regurg regurgitated it back out. You won't have that excuse come tomorrow morning. See, now you shouldn't feel any guilt, as I say, Jewish guilt, because they do it the best to themselves. You shouldn't feel Jewish guilt. Tomorrow, if you continue with the same old, same old, then you ought to feel a lot of guilt, because you'll know better tomorrow. When you go home tonight, you're going to know that there's a different way and that there's a reason why the high-performance individual reacts to situations differently than you do. Now, this is, this is a typical scenario. We all have... I heard people uh, rationalizing last night why they should or shouldn't come to the seminar. And, and you heard me say this also. When a woman or a man that's hot walks by, you know instantly they're hot, right? Do you have to put it... you have to do a Lotus 1, 2, 3 you got to put it in your computer. you got to think about it. I mean, they're either hot or they're not hot. When you see a car that you want to buy, you know really instantly. Yet you'll go through all these machinations. High-performance people don't do that. Because high-performance people aren't afraid of being wrong. As you've heard me say, some of you, I've made over 50,000 business decisions in my career in business. 50,000 probably closer to 55,000 now. That's about 50 or 55,000 more than this room cumulatively put together. I make them like this. And I'm not talking about pencils and stationery. I make them like this. One, because I'm not afraid of being wrong. 
And I've only been right about 30,000 times, 30, 33,000 of those 55,000. I'm not afraid of being wrong because I don't care what my mother thinks about me. I don't care what my father thinks about me. I don't care what my wife thinks about me. I don't care, you know, I, I, do, I don't care what my partners think about me, my employees. I don't care about that. All I care is what Dan Pena thinks about Dan Pena. And one of the things you're going to learn today, as my wife would say, Dan, my love is, my wife worships the ground I walk on. My, she says, my love is transitory compared to Dan's love for himself. Because high performance people like themselves a whole lot. And what you don't know the freedom and the how you'll be empowered, and that's a that's a buzzword. I don't like to use that word because all these doofuses use it. But you don't know, you have no idea how you'll be empowered when you're making decisions and you don't care what the person on the other side of the table thinks. You have no conception. Most of you in this room, probably all of you in this room, could not have said some of the things, even if you had the experience, could have not have said some of the things I told the panel last night. Because basically I told the panel they were full of crap, except for Ted Nicholas. You couldn't do that. You'd think about the ramifications. Ed Taylor thought about the ramifications. What if we want to do a joint venture with these guys? Remember? Yeah, yeah he's going like this. <laughs> I don't care. See, I, I, I'm unique in this. See, I don't have to make a living doing this. I'm really empowered to teach this stuff. Because, you know, whether you buy, and we, I just recently, we just have product, just recently. We didn't used to have it. When Ed came to work with us, he said, well, where's all your product? We don't have any. What do you mean? You know, people used to ask us, so now we put a bunch of stuff together. And I don't mean it, that we just threw it together. I mean, it took months and months and months. But, I mean, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a product line because I didn't have to, I don't have to make a living doing this. I like doing this. You know, I might have paid you to come and li listen to me. <laughs> but that empowers me to tell you the truth, the absolute truth. And for people like Burl Crump, who's heard me virtually all over the country, Canada and in Europe, I mean, you're going to hear things that you've never heard before. But we all go through this rationalization of, I hate when people say, is this a good time to talk to you? I usually hang up. <laughs> no, doofus. <laughs> Why do people do that? They do it because they're insecure. I have never in my life, if my, I heard one of my sons say that the other day and I grabbed him from the, by the throat. Don't you ever say that again on the phone. If you don't think it's a good time, then don't call. And it's always the right time to take on new responsibilities, yet we find ourselves wiggling out of them. Ed. And the reason that we rationalize is because internally we know there's such a thing called pay price to action. Now, I, I'm 15 pounds overweight, my doctor said, and he said, you know, if you wanted to be in perfect health, which everything else is perfect, my health, I'm, I'm well, you should lose 15 pounds. And I said, I'd have to give up three or four martinis and a bottle of wine every night. I'm not willing to do that. It's, I know what it takes and I know what I'd have to do. I used to run marathons. I run the Boston Marathon. And I know what it t took to train. Um, and I'm not, you know, I don't run like that anymore. I stare master. Uh, but I mean, I, we all know how to lose weight. We all know how to get physically fit. We all know how to build our businesses. I can go to the Yellow Pages today and pick out any business that's in this room and I can find somebody that's beating your brains out. I don't care what you do. And as, as some of you have heard me say, but I'm going to say it again because it's important. For this example, again, we all have 100 IQ. For some of you, I'm giving you some. For some, I'm taking away some. We all know nobody can have 10 times our IQ. Well, then why the hell do people make 10 times more than we do, 1,000 times more than we do? Why? Because they think and dream bigger than we do. High-performance people have high expectations, not average expectations.
We all have problems, but we don't want to solve all of our problems. And that's one of the things that we're going to come away with today. A lot of you, here to four, not tomorrow, talk the rhetoric about wanting to be successful, wanting to grow your business, etc., etc. And most of you, it's only talk. Because it's the 90s thing to do. It was the 80s thing to do. That's what you talk about at cocktail parties. That's what you talk about, you know, when you're lying there with your significant other afterwards. Oh, yes, wouldn't it be... Uh, what you ought to be saying is, wouldn't it be nice to be filthy rich? Because you don't really want to be filthy rich because there's a price. There's a pay price to action for everything that you do. Like Eric Hyden, the ice skater, the guy that won seven gold medals or six or eight or whatever, has 32 or 34 inch thighs. Guy worked 10, 12 hours a day for many, many, many years. His whole life revolved around that Olympics he went to. He had a pay price to action. You talk about a balanced life. Do you think that's a balanced life? Do you think because he walks like this, it's balanced? That's another thing we're going to dispel. There is no balance in being a high performance person. I have a balanced life now because I've I spent 10, 15 years killing myself. In 1987, I was away from my family 242 days. 242 days. The reason I know is because I'm a UK resident and I pay UK taxes. I have, I pay, I have paid UK taxes. I was a resident then. And they keep track of when I go in and out of the country. My daughter had just been born. So the first year of her life, I was gone 242 days. That sure as heck isn't balance. My wife would attest to that. So keep that in perspective. Some of you may go away saying, you know, I don't really know this, and I, and I don't really want this now that I understand what it really takes. I've had people at the Castle Seminar. That's why I've, I've just started them bringing their wives. And the wives said, I had no idea that's what it's going to take for my husband to do such and such. Or the opposite, some, you know, I didn't know that was what it was going to take for my wife to do, to, to uh, achieve the things that she wants to achieve. In uh, 1980, or excuse me, 1993, I was, I was giving a talk for the Center for Entrepreneurial Management at the Ritz-Carlton. <coughs> uh, and a guy came up to me, a uh, Hispanic guy. By the way, I'm a minority. I didn't know that until when I was 31 years old. I lived my first 31 years not knowing I was a minority, but now I know I'm a minority. I'm, I'm 49 now. But he came up to me and he said, you know, Mr. Pena, he said, I now understand that, and I don't have to whip myself anymore. I don't want to do that. That's okay. Then just think all those seminars you don't have to go to. Just think all the books you don't have to buy. And just think all the tapes you don't have to listen to. That's okay. The magic of money consciousness. Napoleon Hill said it a little differently. Not quite as articulately as I do, I think. But Spasmatic or occasional effort will be of no value. You must apply until application becomes a fixed habit with you. Poverty is attracted to the one whose mind is favorable to it as money is attracted to him whose mind has been deliberately prepared to attract it. Poverty consciousness will voluntarily seize the mind which is not occupied with money consciousness. A poverty consciousness develops without conscious application of habits favorable to it. The money consciousness must be created to order. You're going to hear me pound to death. You are who you hang around with. You hang around with successful people, high performance, you're going to become high performance. You hang around with doofuses, you're going to be a doofus. Harsh words for the 90s. That's why I do a third of my life pro bono. I just work with the doofuses. I have a third of my life, I run my businesses, and a third of my life, this is what I do. That's why high-performance people that you read about in the social pages do social work. That's how they get their balance.
Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about the money consciousness, and we're going to talk about another one of my Dan's disciples. And uh, we have a famous one here, which hopefully she'll get up and say a few words. She said a few words yesterday, Pearl Crump. But this is a gentleman named Casey Stevenson. Um, he attended uh, my seminar back in uh, May of 1993, actually my first seminar. And um, he is very successful, and he, he bought out uh, ultimately the largest uh, individual jewelry store in California. And last summer I, when I was at the castle, he wrote me this fax. Because one of the things, you have access to me, unlike the other guys. I actually call people. I actually return calls. Yeah, you can actually get a hold of me. And, and no matter where I am in the world, I actually return calls. I returned, Tina Yates called me again, who attended the castle seminar. She's a, a lady who lives up in her Sacramento or something. And they're always stunned when I call them back, you know. It's, um, it's amazing. I mean, I think, at least up till now, I'm the only person I know that returns phone calls. <laughs> that's in this business. I'm the only human me being, some people, you might not think I'm human by, the, by tonight, but <laughs> I'm the only person that I know that returns phone calls, and promptly. But anyway, Casey sends me this fax. There is no need for you to give, no, no, we got them out of order there. Where's the first one? Yeah. Okay, I need to talk to you as soon as possible. It's very important, thank you, Casey. Then I got this next one two minutes later, like he forgot to write it. I need to talk to you as soon as possible. It's very important. Thank you, Casey. Then I call him. I tell him I'm going out to dinner. I'll call him back. There's no need for you to give me a call back. The deal went through, and I am uh, up signing papers right now. I'll talk to you about it uh, this weekend. Casey. When I had talked to him, he was shaking. He says, my deal's falling apart. And those of you, I guess we gave him manuals, right? The manual, uh, there's two case studies because in my, my judgment, there's only two ways a deal can fall apart, internally and externally. All the rest is crap. Internally, externally. Just think, internally, externally. All the rest is crap. So he was on, using Model 2. I think it was using Model 2. And he says, my deal is collapsing just like your deal. And I said, well, do what I did. And, and so then he, he, he accomplished the goal. And then... Uh, a few weeks later, let it be known on Friday the 13th, Minnow Swallows Whale in California. Now see, my whole theory goes against conventional wisdom. In fact, if we took a vote here and everybody voted for one way, I'd automatically vote the other because normally conventional wisdom is wrong. Not always, normally. I have a lawyer that I fade 100% of the time because he's 100% wrong. Great corporate lawyer, but bad businessman. Not even bad, it transcends bad, abysmal or whatever, you know. I won't give him, give him your, uh, I won't give you his name because you might want to use him for a, a business advice. Most people confuse wishing and wanting with pursuing. Their desire for a dream may be desperate and deep, but when the desire fails to produce, they conclude the dream cannot be theirs. How true that is. This morning on the Channel 5, um, that morning program where they got all the goof-offs on Channel 5 KTLA, and uh, the guy that, uh, um, the swank shot, that movie that, uh, with the guy in prison. Yeah, the guy that wrote that was the roommate of one of the newscasters and they were interviewing him about it and he says, I, this sounds slapstick, it sounds really corny, but I just didn't give up. He turned down $2 million for that script because he wanted to produce or direct it himself. $2 million to a guy that's been starving for 15 years and not made a nickel is a lot of money. It's a lot of money to anybody. But he turned it down and he said, but he said, because I knew that I, very much like Stallone did with the Rocky movies, I should be the, the director of this. Because actually the only proof they have is that the longing is not enough, the data at hand merely prove the desire alone does not, cannot deliver. The name of the seminar is Quantum Leap, you can do that, because in the book there's 86 things that people have told me I couldn't do, stretching from you'll never marry a virgin forward, that I've done. And my wife doesn't like that part of the seminar very much. <laughs> but it's the truth, so... It might, might be a little harder to do in the 90s, but... I, I've been, I was married in 1973. Now, as we go through this, you're going to think of reasons why you can't do it automatically. I've listed all the reasons why you can't, that are going to come up. If I didn't... When I mean you can't do it, I mean that you can't follow your dream, you can't be successful at what you want to be, you can't make your revelation reality. 
If I didn't have a spouse and or a family, if I had enough pull, if I had money, if I had a better education, if I had good health, if I only had time, if times were better, if other people understood me, if conditions around me were only different, if I could live my life over again, God knows that, if I didn't fear what they would say, that's the biggest one. I can tell you, I've, uh, we've raised hands over the uh, last year and I've taken votes and all this, and that's the biggest one. If I had been given a chance, if I now had a chance, if other people didn't have it in for me, those are the paranoid ones, if nothing happens to stop me, if I were only younger, if I could only do what I want, if I had been born rich, if I could meet the right people, we're going to talk about meeting the right people. We're going to talk about you are who you hang around with. As I talk to you, just think about all the people you hang around with. And that's including family. Just think how success-oriented your brother, sister, mother, or father are. Just think about it. I'm going to show you some pictures of my family in a little while. You'll be stunned. I mean, it's like uh, something flew over the cuckoo's nest. Whatever that means. You'll be stunned that I could be here. Okay, uh, if I had the talent that some people have, if I dared to assert myself, if I only had embraced past opportunities, I want to talk about past opportunities for a second. My father's investment life, God bless him, he's retired, he's 76 years old in Palm Desert, has, has, has evolved around one thing he did and one thing he didn't. And his whole life has been shaped around that. In 1955-56, right when they were having the A-bomb scare, when everybody was doing uh, deals in the cellar, uh, shelters, my dad and 12 of his friends invested their life savings in a company called the Lucky 13 Mining Company, a uranium mine in uh, um, Nevada. It was a fraud. I mean, there was no uranium, there was no mine. His life savings. And my family and my mother reminded him for many years about that. Uh, my parents are divorced now, otherwise she'd still be reminded, and probably. <laughs> then, in the uh, late 50s, he had an opportunity to buy the corner of um, Topanga, uh, Topanga Canyon Venture Boulevard. Anybody know where that is? All four corners for $3,000. He didn't. He said the, va the value will never go out that far. Now, I kept track of it for a long time. But the first time it, it sold, it sold for like 640000 The next time it sold, it sold for like 2 point something million. The next time it sold, like 4 million. Last time I checked, it, was, it sold for 12 million. Now, his whole life is a reflection of those two decisions. You can't hit a home run unless you swing at the bat or swing at the plate. Babe Ruth led in home runs until recently, and he also led in strikeouts. Most of you are apprehensive, and not just this audience. I, if I were talking to any audience, any place in the world, except for maybe if it was just an, aud uh, an audience of high-performance people like myself, most people are afraid to swing at the plate for all the reasons that we've talked about so far and all the reasons we're going to talk about the rest of the day. But primarily because they don't feel good about themselves and they feel about what the other person is going to think of them. When we get down to it, you're going to, you should go away this evening believing that the key, if you had to say one word, self-worth. High-performance people all have a lot of self-worth. Whether they're fat, ugly, black, green, purple, blue, doesn't matter. They all have a lot of self-worth. They all, any of these gentlemen that I've talked about, um, if they were up here, they wouldn't sound much different than Dan sounds. Some are at the Henry Kissinger end of the continuum. Some are at the Norman Schwarzkopf end of the continuum. You know which end of the continuum I'm at. How many have listened to Napoleon Hill's tapes, any of his tapes? He's a fiery little guy. I mean, he's a, he was only about this tall. I mean, but I mean, he really fires out. I had no idea until I got his tapes a few years ago. I mean, he was a fiery little guy. 
And for his time, because he was doing it in the 50s, he, every once in a while, throwing a little sexual in, innuendo. I mean, he was, he, was, he was great. He was fiery. All these guys are fiery. You can't do what I've done without being fiery. Unless you married it or inherited it or something. I sure as hell didn't do that. Okay. If people didn't get me on my nerves, if that, if, if that precluded anybody from being a high-performance person, I wouldn't be standing up here. Because a lot of people get on my nerves. If I didn't have to keep house and look after the children, if I could save some money, if, if the boss only appreciated me, if I only had somebody to help, if my family understood me, if mine doesn't, I can assure you that. If I lived in a big city, if I could just get started, if I were only free, if I had the personality of some people, if I weren't so fat, if my talents weren't known, if I could just get a break, if I could only get out of debt, if I hadn't failed, some of you in the audience, and this could be any audience, your lives have been uh, formed, as my father's was, around failures in your life. Because you failed at something, you went out and tried something, and you got beat up, and then like a turtle, you put your head back in the shell and you're not going to do it again. There is virtually no chance of being a high performance person. And when I say high performance, I mean high performance, high net worth, high comfort level. And we're going to talk about comfort level. In fact, I'm going to talk about it right now. How many understand what comfort level is? Okay. Most people have a fear of public speaking. I've, I think that's the highest fear people have, public speaking. I got an F in public speaking in high school. It's hard to believe, but I did. Got an F. Uh, and as, as I, some people have heard me say, I wasn't born like this. I'm like this because I have trained myself over the years. I still prepare. I prepared for this talk last night. I still prepare, although I could give this talk asleep. I am, just as, as, as someone said, practice makes perfect. Whoever said that, he or she was smart. That's why Olympic athletes, football teams, etc., etc., practice. I practice being successful. If I still practice being successful, where should you be? You should be right here. You're in the right place. But if I practice being successful, just think about the things you do in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. I work at it. I still work at it. High performance people always still work at it. Comfort level. If, I, um, if we had a 2 by 12 here on the ground, this is about 12 inches across, and I, it was 30 feet long, and I had $1,000 bills at that end, and I had the, you all line up at this end. Everybody in this room, probably, with one exception, we'll figure out a different one for you, could walk up and down the board and pick up $1,000 bills, don't you think? Now, if I put that 2 by 12 10 stories up between two buildings, there may be a couple of you that would crawl across on your hands and knees, you know, slither on your belly but it would eliminate most of you is that correct you're not comfortable 10 stories up if I put it 50 stories up nobody would be there now I walk 50 stories up a lot of people in this audience walk in the basement because they're afraid that the winds go, you know in the room I blow them off the board Ross Pro and guys like that walk 100 stories up now if I put Are we, are we functional? Okay. If I put your significant other, or no, if I put your child, for those of you that had children, across that, 10 stories up, and I put, poured them uh, uh, all over with gasoline, and I had a match, some of the parents, especially the mothers probably, okay, would get across there somehow. Now, if I put your significant other over there and put gasoline, 
I mean, light it. I mean, okay. Yeah. And so, but it's a comfort level. And Jim Newman, who was one of my mentors, and we're going to talk about mentors later on, uh, who uh, developed the PACE organization, Personal Company Effectiveness, and I would recommend, that's one seminar that everybody ought to go to, because Jim Newman, who's been at this, Dennis Whiteley is a, is a, um, is a protege of Jim Newman. Uh, a lot of people are. Um, his stable of successful people is very large, but he's semi-retired. He doesn't do seminars very often anymore. Um, but he developed the, the comfort level uh, concept. It's how we feel comfortable with ourselves and how we feel comfortable in business situations. It's like I told a story about when Don Taylor and I went to dinner the other night. Um, I always get the bill. Don arranged for them to give him the bill. They still brought me the bill. Because I look like somebody that ought to get the damn bill. <laughs> if you don't sit, think that I look different than the other people that were at that thing yesterday, something's wrong with you. You need glasses. When I walk into a room, I take charge, whether there's 50 or 5,000, because I feel comfortable for, with myself and because I practiced. I practiced this years before I started doing it. Comfort and being comfortable with the trappings of success. Some people in this room aren't successful or as successful as they could be because they're not comfortable with what comes with success. A lot of responsibilities. John D. Rockefeller, the old man, said, you know, a lot of responsibilities with being one of the richest men in the world. There are. Not all of them are good. The trappings of super success are heavy. That's why there's not many of us up there. The air is thin. That's why they call us blue bloods. It's not for everybody. If it were true, oh, excuse me, if it were not true that what is to be will be if I hadn't lost my money, if that's the fact, I know that there's life after death because I've been financially dead five times and have risen like the phoenix. I still got ashes on my wings. Five times. I know there's life after death. I've seen that white tunnel. And my white talent's got big dollar signs at the end of it. I'm $50 million poor. Somebody, I, uh, that's not true. I'm about $40 million poor. I, I, I made a faux pas yesterday. I'm about $40 million poor today than I was three years ago. And I still am more successful. You can put them all in a room, lifetime earnings. All the guys and all the tapes you've bought. Just think about that money you've spent. Just think about it. It's tragic. <laughs> if I didn't have a past, then I've got a big one. You're going to find out about it. If I only had a business of my own, if other people would only listen to me. Now, if, and this is the greatest of them all, if I had the courage to see myself as I really am, I would find out what is wrong with me and correct it. Then I might have a chance to profit by my mistakes and learn something from the experience of others. For I know that there is something wrong with me, or I would now be where I would have been if I had spent more time analyzing weaknesses and less time building alibis to cover them. All of the above are fatal to success. And yesterday, when one of the... Um, gentleman alluded to going out in business on a part-time basis and being it safe and comfy and like being in the warm uh, 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 in your mo uh, mother's womb that's not what this seminar is all about because ladies and gentlemen with the greatest respect there is nothing warm and comfy out there in the business world it's tough and as this uh, the man that I alluded to the author of that movie said on TV today he said we've been we've been taught wrongfully so, that being super successful in the beginning should be fun. And that ain't so. Whoever started that myth was a great salesman. For those of you that have participated in athletics, when you have your first football training camp, people are barfing. Two, two programs a day, you're barfing. Is that fun? Not hardly. 
but we've been we've grown up in a, in a country where you can make it but it takes hard work I mean I can go through it, analogy after analogy the Vince Lombardi years the the Pittsburgh Steel uh, curtain years uh, and various you know the the Yankee years all those guys worked hard and business is the same and when we start talking about the very strategies that I've implemented that are pretty simple I was going to say they're simple because Burl's used them, but that's not true. Well, Burl has used them, and they are pretty simple. I mean, it's some, some of the, the reason I only have two models in that book, in my judgment, there aren't any more than two. And by the way, the seminar is, is, um, is only maybe 10% of that book. So the seminar is much more than the book. Most people take the path of least resistance. That's why rivers and most people are crooked. We take the easy way out. Where I'm 15 pounds overweight. I take the easy way out because, you know, what would I do with all my 200 suits? I mean, I'd have to get them all taken in and I can rationalize the hell out of why I don't lose 15 pounds. You know, it would hurt my cook's feelings, my maid's feelings because I wouldn't eat their food. My wife hasn't cooked for me in so many years. I can't, but so I wouldn't hurt my wife's feelings. I mean, and, uh, you know, and uh, there are people starving in Bosnia and I can think all kinds of reasons why I keep the 15 pounds right there. It sl slid a little over the last 10 years. It used to be more up here, but it's sliding down. Maybe pretty soon it'll be down around my knees, probably. Okay. You're here today, and I started into this business because I feel, and I think that some of you would agree with me, that there's an emergency now. Our culture, business culture is changing. We had companies like IBM that were founded by Mr. was founded by Mr. Watson with the idea you'd have a job for life. The Japanese economy that could never turn down has turned down. Uh, in Japan, when you went to work for a company, you went to work for life. Uh, we've had, we're having downsizing, layoffs, whatever you want to call it. Things are changing. The world is changing. The 90s is about selling concepts, selling people, selling things. We have the environmental issues with it. But there's a big emergency. And quite frankly, that's why the other speakers are capitalizing on it. And they made a lot of money. And, not, and I don't mean to say everybody isn't worth a damn that's doing this. There are some quality people. But there's just too many of them because most of them don't have um, the, the experience to be able to talk to you about some of these things. They just don't. And some of them, unfortunately, give you downright false information. Ten yeah, in 10 <laughs> states. I'm going to teach you how to, today, get focused. In the 10 years that I was CEO of Great Western Resources, I didn't expect, uh, accept outside uh, business opportunities. I didn't accept outside speaking opportunities unless they directly had something to do with Great Western or the energy business. I didn't go on any outside boards. I, I was focused. I mean, I didn't do anything else. I was laser beam focused. And you're going to learn today that one of the keys to success, as I've, some of you have heard me say before, is to focus on the very few, not the many. I just thought of an analogy. I don't know how, if I won't get a lightning bolt, but you know, there's only 10 commandments. Right? There's only 10, right? Yeah. 10 commandments. <laughs> we, fo we, we try to do too much. When we talk about management and management style, if you have more than three people reporting to you, or if you're trying to manage more than three people, you're wrong. I only can manage two. And I'm probably a hell of a lot better than most people in this room at it. We try to do too much. We try to put too much on our plate. Now, next time you lose focus, I want you to think about this. Because I've, I've been in front of some really hardcore people. Hardest core was in New York City. The Harvard Club in New York City had the chairman of Chemical Bank there. You let yourself, some of you are willing to let yourself down because you have low self-esteem, low self-worth. You let your family down. There's not many that want to let down their family. Although you only hurt the ones you love normally in life. And you let your business down when you lose focus. So next time you lose focus, just think of that. You're not just letting yourself down because you may not think much of yourself. Hopefully after today you will. But you're letting your family down and you're letting your business down. So whenever I lose focus, I instantly think of that. It's ingrained. It's part of me. It's innate. It's a very important concept. It'll help you 
get focused. When Eric Hyden wanted to not train one morning, and at that time maybe he only had 29 inch thighs, he thought of those gold medals. When Mark Spitz, who I had uh, the pleasure of meeting in Israel a number of years ago, didn't want to practice that morning, he thought of the gold medals. He thought of what he could do, how he could help youth. And, uh, I mean, think of those things. And I like to play a lot of golf. I play golf three to five days a week. And I try to, and I try to have business meetings on the golf course. And I don't like business lunches and business breakfasts. I try to have business dinners. And I, I don't go out socially that much. You may figure that out why by, by, the, by the end of the evening. Because if, if, if you and I were out to dinner and you said something business-wise that was doofus, I'd tell you. I'd say, you're full of shit. I mean, I slipped. I slipped. <laughs> we'll have to edit that. I tell you, and I mean, in, 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 uh, up where I live, I live in Rolling Hills, California, which is a gated community, which uh, the Wall Street Journal says, I don't know if it's true, the, the 600 homes up there is the highest per capita income of any place in the United States. It's on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. My house is 1,660 feet above sea level. I'm 400 feet above the smog line, and I see from Santa Barbara to Newport Beach, and Catalina is right out my window. I have a three and a half acre estate there, and I sit up there, and there's a lot of well-to-do people. And they don't like to come, I mean, just nobody drops by for a drink at my house. I mean, unless they just, you know, I have a putting green and bunkers, and I have a golf center in my backyard, unless, you know, my golfing partners. But we make sure we don't talk about business. I, what, are you crazy? I mean, save that for your wife or your shareholders, not, not me. I mean, trust me. I mean, so, because life's too short to be a fraud. And see, you have no idea how you're empowered. There's some people here, um, uh, the, the, the Harvard uh, young men from Los Angeles, raise their hand. Okay, one, there. You're the only one? Two. Okay, two of them. And uh, a non-Harvard young man from Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm working with seven young men, and I call them the Magnificent Seven. We'll see how magnificent they are as, as time goes on. But one of them, or not one of them, I told them the first time I met with them, you know, how empowered you'll be when you tell somebody, when you're not afraid to speak up and you're not afraid to engage somebody in intellectual or, or discourse, and uh, you don't care what they think when they walk away. And I've gotten feedback that one, it makes them feel good because God knows it does. And two, how it changes relationships around. It just changes. And I'm not talking about being rude. I'm not talking about being arrogant. I'm not talking about being uh, cocky. I'm just talking about being truthful. Rush Limbaugh is that kind of man. And I, I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree. He's the kind of guy that calls a spade a spade or as they say in the United Kingdom, a spade a shovel. <laughs> I mean, you, you have no idea how it empowers you when you, can, when you can do that. Now, this seminar can affect your life in spite of your, pick a number, I'm closer to 50, 438,000 hours of preconditioning. That's how much time you've been putting garbage in. Let's say just for fun that the average age here is 30. Some people like that. 263,000 hours of garbage. False information, bad information. And it can be changed. It can be. I'm going to talk about it a little later. Um, my life changed in 1976 when I went from being a macro-oriented person, excuse me, micro-oriented person to a macro-oriented person. My whole life changed. I was a detail, I would have been a computer nerd. My whole life changed. And at that time I was 31, 32, so I had about 260, 270,000 hours of conditioning. And we'll talk about why that's important. Because nobody ever made money on the micro side of life. All the great money was made on the macro side.
because as Joe Batten, who I've been on the dais with, this is, he came up with the army saying, be all you can be. If you're not going to be all you can be, then I would submit to you, as I've already suggested, you don't, write, you don't need to buy those books, you don't need to buy those tapes, you don't need to do all that doofus stuff, you just don't. You're going to have a lot more free time instead of reading all that crap. Unless you want to be all you can be, then it's, 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 it's debilitating. It's, first of all, I know people that just whip themselves, you know, cane themselves over why they should be something and then when they really don't want to be, and they, they shouldn't be. But if you do want to be all you can be, then what I'm going to say, and I, I hate to use the word, is going to empower you like you wouldn't believe. It's going to give you an, an advantage, a big advantage, because just merely being able to interact with people where you know that you feel good enough to say whatever it takes is a big difference. It's a big difference. But it works both ways. When people tell you, because I'm going to be telling you mostly today, and a lot of things that you're going to hear from me, you're not, you don't want to hear, you don't like hearing. And I can already see the, some people's getting squeamish. I can always tell, because when, the, when their faces go, like this, that I've hit a raw nerve. And I'm not here to hit raw nerves, and I want to say it again, because I get carried away later on in the seminar, and I really start blasting. And uh, I'm not here to hurt anybody's feelings. Just remember that. It's better when there's a bigger group, because then it's not so personal. <laughs> there is no format. I, I do want interaction. Normally, I dominate so much that I don't get that much interaction, but I do, uh, and I do want it. Uh, most important is to get your questions answered before you leave today. Uh, as the book that you have is a timeline, it's an example of, a li of my life of, for 10 years. It embodies everything that I'm talking about. It, it gives examples of everything that I'm talking about, but it only represents 10 or 20 percent of the seminar. But it's, 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 uh, it's an important guide and... Uh, and there's some interesting things in the back of various speeches and things that I've written and, or given that embody what I, what I believe is the foundation, the very precept of uh, how to be a high-performance, super-successful person in business. And it's also filled with penisms, which are kind of my uh, sayings that I've, I've built a career on. My philosophy is basically quite simple. It's the fade conventional wisdom, wisdom almost always. Almost 100% of the time, if you fade conventional wisdom, you'll be right. And I mean that. I've done it so many times. I've won over 200 lawsuits and never lost a lawsuit in the United States. Never. Steve Sussman, who's my primary litigating lawyer, who from the firm Sussman Godfrey, he's the highest paid plaintiff lawyer in America, he said, Dan, the unique thing about you is you have lost the fear of losing. Well, I haven't, I've never lost, so I mean, but you've lost the fear of losing. I don't know how to lose anymore, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure one of these days somebody's going to knock me out of the box, but it hasn't happened in 23 years, but there's always a first for everything. Just imagine if you were empowered but losing the fear of losing and not understanding what it is to lose. Just think about it. From going back to when you were a kid, asking uh, somebody out for, on a date and not being afraid that they... I wasn't that way, by the way. I was, uh, I was petrified, the first girl I ever asked out. But I think about what, what, if, what if I was that way when I was 16 years old? Uh, just, you know, I think about that. Now, you know, just, I remember sitting next to Mel Brooks on a, on a um, um, what's the, the fast jet that goes between? Concord, on the Concord. I don't like the Concord. My head scrapes on the top and the seats are too little. But anyway, and he, we sat for 45 minutes and he finally asked me, he says, aren't you going to ask me who I am or don't you recognize me? And I said, don't you recognize me? I don't care who the hell you are. 
he got up and left. And I sat next to Bob McNamara once, and he told me about, um, this was in the uh, early 80s, no, middle 80s, and he told me about how the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse were going to ride across the world, and famine was going to be all over. I've sat next to some interesting people on that plane, but um, just and, and, and try to get get in the idea or get in the mood that you're, when you leave here today, um, you're going to have that in, in, empowered feeling of of uh, not being afraid, not having that high anxiety. I have anxiety, but I don't have anxiety like you do. I have anxiety about how many successful deals can I accomplish. It's quite different than most people in this room. Since I had the seminar um, last summer, I bought two companies and started two companies, and one of the attendees is still doofusing around looking at one company. The deal either makes sense or it doesn't. Yeah. I mean... Hi, ah, she's she or he's either hot or they're not hot. Damn it! I mean, what does it take? What do you got? You know, you don't have to be Einstein or Werner von Braun to figure this out. You know. But the um, and it's that simple. And and and, and it's I say it's simple because it is simple. Because if it wasn't simple, I wouldn't be here. You know. It's I'm not that smart. I'm really not. I'm just not that smart. I'm not like Michael Milken, who I went to school with. I'm not Michael Milken. Mark is real smart, but he wasn't that smart, now was he? <laughs> and I can assure you, anybody that you've heard in the last three days isn't that smart. In fact, I can guarantee that. So there's no reason why this group shouldn't be able to. Burl has met a number of the people that I've worked with, and are there any geniuses in the group? Actually, it's really the other end of the continuum, but I mean, you know, they're not that smart. They're just not. Of course, Burl's the only smart one. Okay. Okay. Now, it's about decision making. It's about taking legitimate warnings versus ill-founded advice. Virtually all the advice you get is ill-founded. It's not a get rich quick scheme. It's one form of opportunity, and God knows it's not for everybody. I think it should be for everybody, but it's not. It's not for everybody. My market, to use a marketing phrase, isn't the whole world. It isn't. I wish it was. But then again, I, I wish it wasn't because then I really have some, a lot of competition. So, um, like there's a woman in uh, Houston, Texas named Candace Snow who I've been working with a number of years. She was my first real star. And she said that I'll, I'll help you with endorsements, I'll help you do this and that as long as you don't start doing women's seminars in Houston. She said, I got the city wrapped up tight now. I like it that way. I don't want any competition. She's in Milano right now, uh, looking to buy a hotel. I gave her one idea, just one. She was in a business. She owns a company called Executive Lodging, where her 30 or 35 of the Fortune 50 companies are her clients. She, if you're a vice president with IBM and you're going to move to Philadelphia, to Houston, she takes from the womb to the tomb, everything, children, schools, napkins, and she puts them into a condominium and she does all this, or you're moving to London, and she's, she's the biggest in the country, or maybe, or maybe the world at that, and she was renting and leasing all these properties. This was 1986 or 1987, and I came up with the idea, well, why don't you buy them? She owns 55 properties now. Candace Noel, N-O-L-L, she owns 55 she drives a silver Bentley, Bentley. She's 43, drop dead gorgeous, built like Venus de Milo, single. Huh? <laughs> single, and I mean, um, but she intimidates guys. I mean, she's like a little me, a, a woman, little me, a little, you know? She, I mean, she, she meets, if we're gonna meet for coffee, she, she no days, she meets co for coffee. She keeps her Bentley running. The door guy, she sits down, she sits down with a guy, she has, she has a cup of coffee. If she likes him, she, she, she tells him to, to park the car. If she doesn't, she signs the check, shakes hands, gets up and leaves, and just leaves. And I said, you know, that's awful tough, Candace. And she said, Dan, you taught me something. You only get one t time to make a first impression. And if it wasn't good there, it's not going to get any better. 
And that's what I, that's what I, my philosophy. If it ain't, if it ain't, if there aren't stars in my eyes, then if he ain't hot, he's not hot. He ain't gonna get any hotter later on. She's tough, boy. She is tough. But I, uh, my promise is, I, I won't do any lady seminars in Houston. Okay. Now, I want to talk about balance. I, I alluded to it earlier, and, and I'm laying a foundation for these things that we're going to talk about because I want to, I want to clear the cobwebs out of your brain, brains, collective brain, well, maybe it's brain. You've got one brain. Uh, tonight, you'll have all brains. When Napoleon Hill was doing his interviewing of the 500 people that Andrew Carnegie set him up to, set, set him up with appointments over a 20-year period, he wrote that book for 20 years, didn't get paid a nickel. Unbelievable. He only found three people of the 500 that almost had total peace of mind. Three out of 500. Peace of mind, I'll call that's in the 20s and 30s language. We'll call that balance. John Burroughs, Tom Edison, and Carnegie until he became obsessed with giving all his money away. It's... It, it's Eric Hyden, you know, that's not balance. So, you may not want to come all the way over to my end of the continuum, because there's even a farther right, and I don't mean politically, that's not my right, farther right uh, than, than I am, uh, because I've split my life up, I play golf all the time. Uh, there's some guys that just 18 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I'm not at that at that end, but I, you know, uh, even if you come a little bit over my way, you're going to be more successful. You're going to make more money. In my judgment, you'll have a better self-worth, better self-concept, and feel a lot better about yourself. Because as one of the local gurus says, and we're going to take a break on this, success doesn't leave clues. And I'm going to give you a lot of clues by the end of the evening. And right now we're going to take a short break. And Ed's going to talk to you first. And uh, I'll be back in a, in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.